As consumers, the way we buy has forever changed. We no longer rely on physical shops. We visit stores out of choice and not necessity. And when we do decide to make a purchase, be it online or in a shopping mall, we know that the balance of power between seller and consumer has shifted in our favor. We've comparison shopped from the comfort of our computers, tablets, or even smartphones. We've listened to what others have to say about the product, our fellow consumers whose opinions we value, even though we've never met them. We may even have communicated with the seller by email, text, or through their Facebook site. We buy only when we are satisfied that we have covered all of the angles. Some may argue that business-to-business -business buying and selling behavior is different. The big ticket items are not like consumer goods and the greater level of sophistication requires a different, dare we say it, more traditional approach. But consider this, while all consumers are not business people, all business people are consumers. Research is clearly demonstrating that business is adopting, adapting and utilizing some of the very same buyer empowering tactics that we become so adept at using as consumers. Let me share a startling thought with you. Your business is likely involved in many sales cycles right now that you know nothing about. And it's not through any fault of your own necessarily. The fact is you're not directly involved in the sales cycle because the buyer doesn't want you involved yet. Recent research has estimated that buyers are often anywhere from 50 to 60% or more through the sales cycle before they ever engage with the salesperson. Think about that for a moment. Your ideal buyer could be anywhere from halfway to two-thirds of the way through their buying process before they consider connecting directly with you. And of course, the more worrying issue is, how often do you get eliminated from a buying process in favor of a competitor and you never even knew you were competing? Yes, the world of selling is changing. The buyer is in control and they've changed the rules of the game. But like any evolution, or even revolution, smart companies learn how to play and excel under the new rules. The kind of change that I see there is the customer has already done a lot of the comparison before ever a salesperson comes to talk to them. In fact, some studies are showing that well over half the decision is being made by the customer before they talk to salespeople at all. A customer can today access something like 20 times as much data about you and your competitors than they could five years ago. The customer's flooded with that data. They don't need a salesperson to show how we are different from them, how our widget is better than their widget. What the customer's trying to do is evaluate something more complex, to evaluate something with a longer time horizon, to evaluate, for example, a relationship, the kind of relationship they want with a vendor, to evaluate things like the capacity of that person to create significant customer value. Now that we have entered the era of the highly empowered buyer, what impact is that having on the way organizations engage with the marketplace? And given that sales is usually on the front end of that engagement, what impact is the changing buyer having on traditional modes of selling? So the role of the salesperson, the, the, the fundamental role of the salesperson is changing a lot and it's something that, that, that deserves attention. Many won't make the grade, the relationship salesperson, you know, the deal's done on the golf course, the, the you're my buddy, so you're going you're gonna to help me do a deal. The relationship salesperson is now the most ineffective of all kinds of salespeople. So instead of me coming to you and saying, you know, we had that nice game of golf and we worked, to, you know, we've, we've known each other a long time, what I need to do is come to you and say, I've worked with a lot of companies in your industry. I do this every day. This is what I do as a job and I've learned a lot. So here's some insights for you about what I think you should do to do your business better. And the salesperson needs to be more of a, a, a value creator than a value communicator. But surely, as some will argue, there is still a relationship element in every sale, a trust factor, a credentialing process. The truth is there is a conversation taking place. This process is happening. It's just happening in a different way and often with people other than the vendor. Information, for example, is being shared and exchanged with their peers through networking sites like LinkedIn. Or in fact, they are interacting with us, but not in overt ways like in the past. They may be asking questions on our LinkedIn group 
or accessing information for our website or YouTube site. The challenge that we have as sales and marketing professionals is by not being in the room, in the conversation, when that information is changing hands, we miss out on the understanding of how that information impacted the buyer. We don't see their body language. We don't see if they're interested and engaged or disinterested and, um, and disengaged. So what we need to do as sales and marketing professionals is look at their online behavior and piece together their digital body language to give us the same understanding of their response to that information. So how can a salesperson start to adapt to these new buyer behaviors and obviate the risk of becoming disintermediated? What new skills and tactics do they need to integrate into their daily work practice? Individual salespeople have to be able to target messages to constituencies within their customers' organizations. Uh, there, there's no such thing anymore as a standard message or a standard value proposition. That has to be customized and tailored and focused toward individual constituencies within individual customers. Every salesperson needs to understand what comes up when they Google their company name, their product names, uh, when they Google their biggest customers. They need to know what comes up because that's exactly what potential customers are doing. By the way, here's something else that most salespeople don't know, and I would, I would challenge salespeople on this. If you're about to have a conversation with a potential customer, many of those potential customers will Google you or go to LinkedIn and find out information about you, about you personally, you as a salesperson. If a whole bunch of great information about how wonderful and helpful you are and maybe your blog and your Twitter feed comes up, wow, that's pretty interesting. This person's pretty happening out there. I, 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 obviously, the market trusts this person. Look at all the comments on their blog. Look at how many people are engaged with them by following them on Twitter. Maybe I should trust this person. Well, nobody does that. Salespeople don't do that because they're focused on this old way of thinking. Sales in the modern era is still about creating value, but the way that value is created and the media used to create that value is changing. A salesperson today becomes part researcher, part micromarketer. They need to have a greater level of business acumen than ever. They need to be insatiably curious about the business of their customers, even when those businesses are spread across multiple segments and verticals. They need to be bringing insight and ideas to their customers and creating value at every juncture of the buying cycle. Understanding that the velocity of business change is only increasing. Many salespeople might not make the grade uh, because it's hard work. Because you've got to do the research, you've got to learn, you've got to learn enough about the business to have insight. And, and, and once you do that, your relationship changes dramatically and it's not about a relationship. Changes are happening faster than ever before inside the customer. And the winners are getting in there before a need develops. What they're doing is they're challenging the customer with ideas, with possibilities, more and more looking to create value and to keep a presence there in the customer. Another point is the importance of the individual salesperson. Uh, if you don't want to be relegated as interchangeable and insignificant, the salesperson has to have the ability to make a real personal difference. We call it personal capital to bring to the party uh, connections, experience, business insights, and the ability to probe and educate their customer. And uh, this is certainly something that's different now from how it was a number of years ago. If you look at what today's best salespeople are doing, they are changing their behavior. They're understanding the buyer's digital body language. They're looking at what that buyer is doing online, what they're searching for, what they're looking at, what they're not looking at, and using that to come up with an understanding of what they're most likely to be interested in and what questions are most likely burning in the back of their minds. And then using that insight to become that helpful, trusted advisor that the buyer wants. By looking at those buyer's cues in their digital body language, they might select a particular white paper to send out to them or put them in contact with a certain resource or connect them with a certain reference or answer a question that they know is in the back of their mind. Proactively, based on understanding that buyer's digital body language. And by doing that, even though this relationship is now developing in the digital sphere, it's all 
online as an, as an interaction, it's still developing that very personal, trusted advisor relationship that the salesperson needs to develop in order to guide that buyer across the finish line of the buying process. As we have heard, the challenge for sales is creating value through the buying cycle, whether engaging early with the customer to provide business insights and help the customer through their journey, or later in the process where they have observed and understood the digital body language of the buyer as they have gone through a discovery process that has been facilitated more directly by marketing. Bottom line is that the successful salesperson going forward will not be relying on one or two modes of interacting with the buyer, but will be adept at seamlessly leveraging everything from face-to-face -face selling to indirect selling through value creation in online groups and everything in between. But what about marketing in this equation? What challenges does this changing buyer hold for it? I see so many organizations that do campaign-based marketing. They're looking at doing something next week, next month for the new product they're launching in, in six months from now. And that's marketing that's on the time frame of the company which is sort of an egotistical approach to marketing, isn't it? So the approach that works better in my mind is to focus on people when they're looking for what you have to offer. Specifically, when they're looking for what you have to offer on the web, either by using search engines to search for something interesting or by tapping their online network, friends, colleagues, family members, through social networks, or through Twitter, through blogs, um, through LinkedIn, through Facebook, um, sites like that. And the way to do that is to engage with people when they're looking and put content in front of them when they're interested. Uh, and that requires that you engage with them now. Now what's interesting about this is that it, it is actually for the entire buying process. It's from the, I don't never heard of your company before and I find it through search or I find it through social networks. So it works at the very top of the sales process. But also as people are going through the process of trying to make a decision of what companies to work for, what types of products to buy or services to acquire, they're also doing that research, asking friends and colleagues, going to the search engines in the middle and even the bottom part of the sales process. So it works for the entire sales process. Clearly the traditional view of marketing is simply being a lead generation engine focus at the top of the funnel no longer holds true. Marketing has a rapidly evolving role that takes it much deeper into the buying process than ever before. The role of marketing in the consultative problem-solving sale is around the buying cycle of helping customers at each stage of the buying cycle make better decisions by providing sales with tools to help them analyze problems in the recognition of needs stage, to differentiate in the evaluation of options stage and in the resolution of concerns phase to have risk reduction tools to make customers feel safe. Things like case studies, videos, site visits, anything that will help the customer feel safe. In many cases, marketing is looking at things from a product-centric approach. And that is, if we build the product, that we believe meets the market needs, whether it does or not, uh, it's up to the salespeople to sell that product or push it out into the market. Uh, and uh, we don't believe that marketing in many cases gives salespeople what they need from a tools perspective, from a messaging perspective, from a targeting perspective, in order to be able to be successful. What marketing needs to focus on is, is indeed the number of leads and of opportunities, but also how can they increase the velocity at which those opportunities move through the sales cycle. What's the role of, of marketing in, in supporting sales when the salesperson is trying to increase their average deal value, when they're trying to increase their win rate, when they're trying to shorten their sales cycle, or when they're trying to move things through the funnel? Organizations need to recognize that the part marketing plays in the buying process has expanded and that it is a role to play at every phase of the cycle. Sometimes that role will be the primary one where they are the main interface between the organization and the buyer, supplying them with the information they need, helping to create value for them by uncovering the needs of the buyer and facilitating their discovery process. Sometimes their role will be a supporting one, helping sales customize their value proposition or supplying them with the tools to help the buyer better evaluate them. Sometimes it'll be a partnering role, where both sales and marketing are working together to help the buyer make their final decisions 
and resolve any concerns they have through relevant success stories and access to testimonials. Whatever the role they are playing, the important point is that they are now playing a role at every stage, not just the front end. To look at it another way, the revenue generation process has become a continuum where sales and marketing are constantly and consistently engaged with their market in a much more fluid, overlapping and ultimately partnering way. But this can only be achieved through genuine sales and marketing alignment that goes well beyond the limited definition of alignment that most organizations labor under. So sales and marketing alignment is kind of a key issue that, that, that I think has come to the fore a lot more recently. In the past, um, if you kind of look at sales and marketing folks, they've been in many ways misaligned. Um, there's a stat that says marketing people think that 89% um, of the leads they give to salespeople are, are, are good. Salespeople think that 25% of what they get are good. Um, salespeople think they do all the work, you know, and marketing people just color the pictures, right? Um, and in truth, uh, what needs to happen is, the f is, is, is they're both right and they both need to change. So um, marketing folks have focused on generating leads, building brand, doing those kind of things and, and if you like bringing stuff in the top of the sales funnel. The reality is number of leads is just one of the kind of one of the factors or one of the levers that govern how you drive revenue. Clearly marketing's move beyond its traditional prime the pump role into a value creation role requires a level of organizational flexibility. And those organizations which can accommodate less rigidly defined sales and marketing structures and modes of operating will gain distinct advantage. Insight and content have real value, but their value can remain unrealized if they are not delivered in ways that the buyer wants to receive them. So leveraging multiple communications channels becomes critical. We're going to see a blurring between the work life and the social life of our sales and marketing teams. Salespeople have got an important role to play in engaging across social media with their buyers and potential buyers. And the marketing teams have an important role in supplying content for that. Where I see the demarcation breaking down, however, is this whole, you know, marketing creates leads and salespeople follows up on leads. That's where it's completely breaking down because there's no longer this, this strict way of I create leads and then you close leads because everybody can create content. The salesperson can create content that the buyers will see. The marketers create content that the buyers see. The marketers are creating content for the entire sales process. Um, so there's no longer this strict, uh, you know, handoff, you know, the, the salesperson uh, gets the leads after the marketers create the lead. If the nature of how a trust relationship is established between the buyer and the seller is changing, and to a large degree this process has been wrestled away from the seller by the buyer, and indeed other third parties that enable and empower buyers, how does an organization need to adapt to this change? I think that as we move into this new era, Companies need to think much more about a two-way dialogue rather than broadcasting. And why that's interesting is because most companies don't really operate like that. They think about pushing out their messages and, and promoting their brand, but they don't tend to think about that two-way dialogue. In fact, let's face it, the only time we have a two-way dialogue with a, with a company is often when we make a complaint and we call the call centre. So what do I think the implications are? I think that the implications are firstly that these non-owned channels, the social media channels, think Facebook, think LinkedIn, these non-owned channels are often the ones where we can build that two-way relationship between buyers and sellers. I think the implication for sales is that we're going to have to use these channels more actively as part of our relationship building. The implication for marketing is that marketing is going to have to ensure that our brand and our presence, so the whole company profile, is similar across those channels so that it looks like one united front, one single unified brand. If you look at the nature of how humans shift their perspectives, much of it comes down to trust. Much of it comes down to 
trusting the source of the information rather than just looking at the information itself. So to better align our sales and marketing organizations around this, we need to begin to understand who is sharing the information. Is a prospective buyer getting their information from someone that they trust, who's a known influencer in the space, who is likely to cause that person's perspective to shift, or are they getting the information from someone who they have no respect for, who they don't trust, who is not an influencer in the space? So here we are in a brave new world where the buyer-seller relationship is built on the foundation of an ongoing dialogue one that may begin early in the sales process through providing business insights and thought-provoking ideas, and it may be the salesperson who is the driver of this, or indeed it may be the marketing person. It may be done directly, face-to-face, -face, or indirectly through networking sites or blogs. Or the relationship may be built in a more hands-off fashion, where the buyer builds a composite profile of the seller by accessing information from a variety of sources before they ever engage directly with the selling organization, be that with a salesperson or with marketing. The underlying challenges are obvious. Firstly, your organization must be able to leverage all communication vehicles effectively from traditional face-to-face -to, -face to the plethora of digital media. Your salespeople need to be comfortable switching from mode to mode. Your marketing people need to be comfortable carrying the sales process further. Both parties need to work in tight collaboration to ensure the buyer gets what they want, when they want it, and through what medium they want it. Furthermore, it becomes critical that a selling organization understands that their messages, their communications, regardless of how it is delivered, must be buyer-focused, it must be consistent, and it must be valuable. It cannot simply fluctuate from marketing broadcast speak to sales product push but rather it needs to be insightful, targeted, value creating at every stage of the buying cycle. The solution is simple. If we focus on the buyer, learn their language and be guided by their preferences and seek at every interaction, whether direct or indirect, to create value for them, then we will be very successful. But as with all things, simple does not always equate to easy.